Hello, David. Hey, hi. How are things in Rochester? What's that? Good, good. Getting warmer. Oh. Is the, yeah. Are the lilacs going to be out for the festival? I don't know. Um, I haven't looked at the latest forecast. No. It's supposed <laughs> to be next week, I heard. Uh, from the 12th to the 21st. Yeah. yeah. I sent you an email. The 12th to the 21st is when the whole thing happens, and they have different events during the week. So that will actually be after next week. Next week and after. So, so I'm, I'm assuming that's the median time that they. That's why they have it then. Is that that's yeah. when they tend to come out. Yeah, it's, although it's kind of like uh, the cherry blossom festival in DC. It's you can. Yeah. Do, yeah. The, uh, we were there. Uh, they were just. They were having the cherry blossom festival parade the day we were there, but the cherry blossoms were gone. Oh, we came early. In fact, we we saw some of the remnants. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now it's funny because they might last walk if it stays cool. Like we have trees down our street that have white blossoms on them. Yeah. They're like, yeah. but they're tall. They're not like an apple blossom, and mm -hmm. they've been blooming for like over a week. You know, but if you get like a couple hot days, they'll bloom and, and go in like two days. Yeah. What the other thing is it, is this the same problem Carol has? With oh, geez, what happened? Is your shutter I... closed? Let me look. It, I had it, and now it's gone away. How about how about on your Zoom window? Does it have a little crossed out camera in the lower left? Hi. Does it say um, stop video or start video in your lower corner? Um. Lower left. Well, I don't know on them on the PC. It's lower left. I'm not seeing anything that looks like that, and I just. Can you see us? Let me. Let me uh, because there's let nothing me... that indicates your camera's shut off, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let, let me uh, get out and get back in again. How's that? Okay. Um, you have any messages from the other well, side? Maybe you, maybe you, maybe you didn't join with video. I have to select and join with video when I. Yeah. Okay. What the screen's going? In and out. I don't know what what's still going on with this. Uh, talk amongst yourself. I'll fix it. No. <laughs> I don't know why. I can't see you. Oh, you can't oh, see. Okay. okay. So no, it's not like Carolyn. No. <laughs> well, uh, Carol could see us and hear us, wouldn't she? We couldn't see her. Carol sometimes had that camera with a slash to it at one point. We're not see we're just seeing a black screen from the um, I'm not even seeing my black screen now. I've, I'm back to launching the meeting. Oh. That's why I want to get out and go back you in. You might have a little out. window open. It might be a little window in your tray somewhere. Yeah. I, okay. As I say, talk amongst yourself. I'll fix it. Okay. I don't know what I did. There's Helen. Hi, Helen. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Hey, I'm not the last one for once. <laughs> well, the old machine was terrible sometimes. It would take me 10, 15 minutes to, to link in. Yeah, that you do seem to be a lot zippier now with this thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like I guess when I did uh, some speed tests on it, it was like up to 10 times faster than the old machine doing something. So. Oh, okay. So I got this much. Now what happened? I do. Good evening. Hey, good evening, Dale. How's everybody? Good. 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 If you excuse me, but I'll start the other one. Mm. Uh, fixed it. <laughs> Okay. Oh, there you go. What was it? Uh, it it was a combination of uh how the screen had gotten shifted over and the oh. button had gotten moved. So okay. I kept trying to do one and then the other, and I finally got both of them. Yeah, if your window's not right. correct. Okay. Um, operator error. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I got to get a pen. We just need to. Oh, 
is Pastor Mary. Good evening. Hey, Pastor Mary. How you doing? Good evening. Hi. Oh, I like you with eyeglasses on. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I like that look. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're just, uh, so I got a message from Danita. She can't join us tonight. So we're waiting on Carol. Mm -hmm. So you can, Dale, you can call me pastor again because I'm beginning to serve Ebenezer Lutheran Church in Willimantic. Oh my goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. You keep on going. You're like the energy bunny. <laughs> you're always, you're always you pastor. Going and going. Oh. Maybe you yeah, could you take the opportunity to explain Ebenezer, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you the best, and especially in your travels, that quite a way, isn't it, Pastor Mary? Well, it's not. It's not that much farther than St. Mark and Norwich was. You know, it's just from up to Willimantic. It's not that far. Uh huh. But I don't travel up there often. Oh, you go right up there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just go. It's Carol. Yep. Ray will be with us shortly. He's oh. finishing up, cleaning up the, from dinner. He's handy to have around, isn't he? <laughs> yes. Yes, he loves to do the dishes. It's like playing with water is his thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just want to say I'm here. Okay, can you see uh, us? Yes, Carol. I can, I can see you. Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, if you can hear us, knock three times. And I can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> I can see uh, yes, you. can't knock twice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, these things always remind me of a seance. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, everybody's here. Um, okay, so tonight, so we are on. Uh, so we have, uh, this is our, we have our session tonight and we have three more after tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about, there's going to be two um, sessions on sacrifices. Um, and Professor Cohen will sort of give an overview. Um, there are sacrifices for all sorts of reasons. Um, one can do them in Thanksgiving. Uh, one can, uh, one can do them for uh, um Apopotraic reasons, which is a word you can use casually now, which means that to ward off evil uh, spirits or something. Um, so, uh, so he's going to rather quickly go get into the idea of, of atonement sacrifices, uh, because this is kind of central to this lecture and the next one, where we talk about what it is that we think Jesus did and how that we interpret that through the Hebrew scriptures, um, and. Uh, so that's, yeah, it's a fairly, I don't know if you remember Pastor, I think Pastor Hammonds several years ago during Lent did a session on uh, the whole theology of the cross, you know, what, what kind of sacrifice or what was Jesus doing there for us? Um, so, and, and this is one, one, I, this is one set of ideas that come from the Hebrew Bible, or at least the Christians have taken from the Hebrew Bible. So, um, any questions? Oh, no further ado, we'll charge on. <laughs> Share the screen. Share the sound. So uh, if you take Religion 101, you will talk about sacrifices because the, this is a well-known anthropological conundrum. What is it that possesses human beings from the Aleuts to the Zulus and everybody in between uh, to want to worship the Lord, serve the Lord, the gods, gods, however, demons, whatever, right, by slaughtering animals? Because after all, that's what we mean. 
right? We're slaughtering an animal and then we're processing it in some mysterious uh, way under very specific instructions, and it's part of a ritual, part of an organized ceremony. This is a very, very powerful human impulse in what do we think we are doing when we sacrifice. So that's a big problem. Lots of well-known classical books in anthropology and religious anthropology of religion in Religion 101. That's not my problem here. I can't solve everything for you in this course, although I solve lots of things. But I can't do that. So I'm just going to move right along and say there is a well-known human tendency that humans like to worship the god, gods, through sacrifices. And then again, I mean by the ritualized slaughter of animals. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about. So in the Torah, in the narratives of Genesis, this is sort of uh, under, self-understood that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and before them actually Noah comes out of the flood, or before them Cain and Abel, right? There is a powerful human impulse recognized by the Torah that even these patriarchs, well before Mount Sinai and the Revelation and so on, right? Their stories of Genesis, they're building altars and offering sacrifices. And I gave you some passages to look at on, on the syllabus which do document that. When we get to the actual legislation of the Torah, we have here extraordinarily developed, uh, detailed, nuanced set of regulations about animal sacrifices. It's not just that you go to your backyard and take, your, uh, take a sheep and do whatever you want. No, no, no. They're very specific rules, very specific uh, requirements. There are different kinds of sacrifices. The big point to remember here is not all sacrifices are atonement sacrifices. That's the big point. All right, let's see that. There are lots of different kinds of sacrifices described in great detail in the first half of the book of Leviticus, and with some <coughs> extra information also in the book of Numbers. There are public sacrifices. By that we mean the sacrifices are brought by and on behalf of the whole house of Israel. Not Joe Schmo, but the people of Israel, as represented by their priests, bring a sacrifice on the altar. That sense is public. The most important of these is the tamid sacrifice. The tamid is a word in Hebrew which means continual or continuous. I can't remember which one is which. Uh, all the time. That's what a tamid means. It's all the time. Right, sacrifice. Because it's brought every morning and every afternoon. What? It's both. It's both. It's the continual and it's continuous. It's all the time. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Okay. Uh, let's not get hung up on that. Uh, let's get hung up on other things. Yeah, so it's offered every morning and every afternoon. It's offered every morning, it's every afternoon. Doesn't matter if it's the Sabbath. Doesn't matter if it's a holiday. Doesn't matter if it's a festival. It doesn't matter. It's offered every morning when it's sort of, that's how the tabernacle in the morning gets going with the tabernacle sacrifice. And that's the end of the business day in the tabernacle. It's closed with a tamid sacrifice. Then in between, you can offer other sacrifices. But this is uh, the tamid sacrifice, the continual offering, which will loom large in later Jewish thinking that these are the essential ones. That is to say, without these, you don't have a temple. You don't have a tabernacle. OK, jump ahead a second. In rabbinic thinking, the tamid of the morning sacrifice corresponds to the morning prayers. Morning prayers correspond to the morning tamid sacrifice. Similarly, the late afternoon prayers will correspond to late afternoon tamid sacrifice. Rabbis will later on see correspondence between those. Okay, that's the tamid. Then you have Sabbath festivals, Sabbath sacrifices. Then you've got festival sacrifices, right? And this is all spelled out in great detail in the book, uh, in the book of Numbers. They also have sacrifices for special occasions. What's the point of these sacrifices? I'm not sure exactly. The text doesn't explain it. Simply, this is what one does. This is what God demands in the Torah of the people of Israel, to bring these sacrifices as delineated on these days, on these occasions. Tamid, every day. These are public, as opposed to private sacrifices. By private, I mean we're Joe Israelite. Right? May want to bring a sacrifice to the tabernacle or to the altar. Why did Joe Israelite want to bring a private sacrifice? Well, it depends. Joe Israelite wants to go on pilgrimage to the sacred center, described in Deuteronomy. 
there's an obligation to go on pilgrimage. And if you're going to go on pilgrimage, there's an obligation not to show up empty-handed. You should come along with a pilgrimage sacrifice. Joe Israelite, of course, wants to do the Passover sacrifice, which at least in Deuteronomy, at least, is celebrated at the central shrine. We discussed that already briefly. This is also part of the pilgrimage festivals. Then there are special occasions. Abundant harvest. Numerous grandchildren. Right? Sons. Right? I am grateful to the Lord. Let's have a family feast. Let's go to the central shrine and we'll have a big family feast. Right? Slaughter animal. Roast beef. Yeah. Right. That's so I'll have a family feast. That's so that, that's also one of the kinds of one of the kinds of sacrifices. Then you've got all kinds of private free will sacrifices. I can't go into details. It's, it's described in detail. The point is you have a complex and nuanced system of sacrifices outlined in the first half of the book of Leviticus. Now, what will loom large in our discussion today are atonement sacrifices, sin offerings, right? Offerings because you feel guilty about something. You committed a sin. You committed a sin on purpose. You committed a sin by mistake. You're not sure if you committed a sin. Gee, did I do that? I don't remember. Um, but I feel guilty about it. Right. For whatever reason, how you unburden yourself in this society, in this culture, you bring a sacrifice to the central shrine. Okay? So some of these sacrifices have that function. Right? They are so labeled. Sin offerings. Or trespass offerings. Okay? And if you ask me, how does sacrificing a ram or a lamb help atone for sin? I will say to you, I have no idea. But that's what it says. See aforementioned Religion 101. Okay, any questions? Yes, Chris. Uh, is there a, an example of a um, uh, pre-Sinaitic commandment to sacrifice? No. No. Okay. Just in the narratives in Genesis, you have the patriarchs building altars and offering sacrifices. Okay, but there's no commandment. That's no commandment whatsoever. Okay. 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 Thank you. Maybe just what Jeremiah is referring to. Okay. We'll talk about Jeremiah shortly. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay, now I'll, just, I'll make one last quick point. We who go to the supermarket and buy meat wrapped in cellophane in a styrofoam tray, we have no clue as to the religious power, the numinous power involved in these sets of rituals. Okay? For us, it is completely foreign. It is about as foreign as can be. Right? Because for us, we think the, temp the temple, as a result, is basically a slaughterhouse and a barbecue, to use our terminology. How is a slaughterhouse cum barbecue, right, a place of spiritual elevation? Answer is, we don't know. We're so cut off from this whole world, right, and from this natural cycle, etc., that we don't understand it. We westernized, sanitized westerners don't understand it. See Religion 101, as I said, in which sanitized westerners will do their best to try to understand it. Right? <laughs> Right, so you read Durkheim and Weber and all the usual suspects, right, to try to understand what, what this is. Okay, move along. <coughs> of the sacrifices, the most important to, the most important for our purposes are atonement ones, because where we're going with this topic is our atonement, right? And of the atonement rituals, the most important sacrifice is described in Leviticus 16. Right, the atonement sacrifices on the, what will later become to be called, the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement. This is spelled out in extraordinary detail in this, uh, this uh, chapter. The word is Kippur, le kaper is the word used, Kippurim, uh, gives us a Day of Atonement, or in English we say Yom Kippur, uh, Yom Kippur. The interesting thing is that on the original level of meaning of the text, and look at your notes in the JSP, who bring this out very nicely, uh, it seems that sin the effects of sin are understood as something like pollution or contagion, i.e., sin is a thing. It's a negative thing. The way I uh, like to describe it would be, let's say you keep your house very clean. 
you vacuum daily, you wipe down the furniture, and so on. But you know what? At the end of the year, you go down to your uh, 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 forced air system and look at your filter, it's filthy. Why is it filthy? It's filthy because it's filthy. Dirt piles up. No matter how careful the Israelite people are to avoid polluting the sanctuary by bringing impurity into contact with the sacred, it happens. Women menstruate, women give birth, men ejaculate, people die. There is impurity inside the camp. That impurity collects like the dirt on the filter. And once a year, the high priest has to go into the central sanctuary, the innermost sanctum sanctorum, holy of holies, and wipe it down. Wipe it clean of all the, all the accumulated impurities, the impur accumulated contagion. That's the original focus of Leviticus 16 of Yom Kippur and the root kapar, K-P-R in English, right? That original root meaning of that is not atone. The original root meaning is to wipe, to wipe clean. The high priest is wiping clean the altar, sorry, the innermost sacred shrine, right, from the accumulated residual effects of impurity, which will inevitably naturally occur. <coughs> However, there's another voice in that chapter. You can already see the chapter is already at war with itself, Leviticus 16, where on the one hand we have the force of impurity that we're wiping clean, and that gets translated into, equated with, sin. So it's not just impurity that brings about the accumulated contagion that we need to wipe clean, but it's also sin that has the same, dare I say it, magical or physical magical effect, which similarly needs to be wiped clean. And that's what you have in several uh, uh, of these uh, verses, notably uh, For on this day the Lord will wipe you clean to purify you, Leviticus 16, 30. From all your sins you will be purified which we have a confusion between the category of purity and the category of atonement, which sin is equated with impurity and consequently purification is equated with atonement. That, according to most scholars, look at the notes in the JSB, is a secondary layer in the text. But it's there, secondary, secondary. It's right there in the text. And later Jews and Christians will look at it and see this is what it's about. It's about atonement. It's about removing the negative effects of sin. Now, also in Leviticus 16, you have the dramatic story of the two goats. This is where our English phrase scapegoats come from. It comes from right here, Leviticus 16, right? In which uh, one goat is offered up on the altar as a sin offering, and another goat is, the scapegoat, is sent off into the wilderness for which the high priest has transferred the sins, the impurities of the household of Israel onto the goat, and the goat is sent away. Go away, go far away. What happens to this goat is not clear in the text. The goat is simply sent away. Later Jews and Christians reading this chapter, by the Second Temple times, I think when it actually was a real live practice ritual, the goat was not simply sent away, the goat was killed. Goat was sent away and chased over a cliff. My goat. Right? So the goat took with him outside the camp, outside the perimeter of the society, is taking the sins, impurities, two are conflated, away, out of the camp. And if you say, this sounds like magic to me, yeah. The rabbis at least knew that. Sure, it looks like a magical, trans, physical transference ritual. And once again, I'm a good Protestant. I don't say spirituality here. Don't worry, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to that. That's the text. That's Leviticus 16. 
Note the confession of the high priest, 1621. The priest is going to confess all the sins of the household of Israel and transfer them onto the goat. What is this confession of the high priest? Is this a spiritual unburdening? No, spiritual, spiritual. Not in this layer of the text. It is the physical transference of the sins of the household of Israel to get them out of the household of Israel, onto the goat, and then out of here. Later on, of course, as later Jews read the text, it does become a spiritual unburdening. Oh God, we have sinned, we're unworthy, you know, blah, 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 that whole thing. Right, that's not in the text. That is read into the text by later Jewish, and then, as we'll see, Christian readers. Okay, vicarious atonement, last bullet point here. So here we have this anticipation of the idea of vicarious atonement. This scapegoat, this goat, takes the sins away. The goat dies so that we may live. That's vicarious atonement. A suffers so B will be happy. All right, that's not te too technical a way to present it, but that's what it in effect it means. So the goat, the goat is taking the sins away and dies. And as a result, we are unburdened of our sins. Or in Protestant language, our sins are shriven. Look that one up. Okay, that's Leviticus 16. An absolutely stunning chapter. Uh, absolutely amazing chapter with numerous layers, numerous things going on. And for both Jews and Christians later on, reflecting on atonement, how we humans unburden ourselves of sin and the residual effects of sin, <coughs> Leviticus 16 will be a chapter worth chewing on. Right? To anticipate, our friends, the rabbis, will see the power of repentance at work and the power of scriptural study in Leviticus 16, even though we don't have any goats anymore. Right? And for Christians, of course, the goats will represent Christ, the suffering of the goat, who will die on our behalf so that we may live and the goat will die. Who is that of class? I'm not going to tell you. All right. <laughs> you have to figure that out on your own, right? I can't do everything for you. Okay, that's uh, Leviticus 16. Worth reading carefully with the notes in the JSB. It's an extraordinarily rich and interesting chapter. It's also so, as we would say, weird. That's Leviticus 16. Okay, vicarious atonement. That brings me to Isaiah 53. The classic text, especially in Christian piety, the classic biblical text that outlines vicarious atonement, how Christ suffers for our sins. Ooh, did I say Christ? How something or somebody is suffering for our sins. The classic biblical passage is Isaiah 53. But no, it includes the last verse of Isaiah 52, but I'm not going to worry about it. Okay, Isaiah, Isaiah 53. So, first of all, who is this Isaiah? According to religious traditionalists, Jewish and Christian alike, this is Isaiah of Jerusalem, that same chap, uh, same guy we've mentioned a number of times, who lived around the year 700 BCE. However, according to all modern Bible scholars, including the Jewish Study Bible annotators, right, we are convinced that this is not Isaiah of Jerusalem of the year 700 BCE, but a bloke who lived centuries later, probably in the middle of the 6th century BCE, say 550 or something, maybe even a little later, uh, who's anonymous, who's, who's not anonymous, but whose prophecies were stuck on to the back of the book of Isaiah, because he seems to have been much an admirer of Isaiah, right? So we call him Second Isaiah because we don't have a name to call him. We don't want to call him Bob. So we'll call him Second Isaiah. And some scholars think it's not Second Isaiah. It might be Third Isaiah. Well, actually, not 53. Probably Second. What the hell? At this point, you don't care. All right. So we're probably not the original Isaiah of Jerusalem, probably an anonymous prophet, a stunning, stunning, amazing guy who lived a few centuries later. Okay. That does not affect our concerns here in the slightest, but I thought you should know. This is one of the servant songs of Isaiah. In the 19th century, a German biblical scholar noticed that this second Isaiah fellow likes this motif of the servant of the Lord. It's a prominent motif in his prophecies. And there are four sets of songs, which he called servant songs, right? In which we have not just a line or a motif, 
but actual paragraph about the servant of the Lord. And of these, this is one of those suff uh, servant songs. This is often called the, the suffering servant song. It's about the servant who suffers the sins of others. So here's a brief excerpt on your handout. He was despised and rejected by men. If you know the Handel's Messiah, of course, you'll start singing this immediately. He was despised. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> and rejected a man and man of sorrows. Well, he was suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, surely, he hath borne our grief. All right, this is still straight handle of the Some of you worked on this in your papers, yes? Anybody do have this beside? Maybe yeah, somebody must have done it. Okay. He took up our infirmities, carried away our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten with him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Ooh, it must have been a translation there. Uh, Christians know exactly what that means. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed by our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Well, if you are a Christian and you read this, you know exactly what the prophet is talking about. Uh, there can be no doubt. And already the Gospels already allude to Isaiah 53 uh, in the Passion narrative, although really it's mostly post-New Testament writers who will develop this at great length, including our friend Justin, who quotes Isaiah 53 complete, right? Because for him it's obvious, it's a no-brainer that Isaiah is talking about Christ. Now the interesting question is, what is Isaiah, or whoever he was, what is he really talking about? I understand that Christians have every right to interpret this as referring to Christ, but surely, or surely, right, it is not likely that a prophet of the 6th century BCE is going to be talking about Jesus of Nazareth who lived centuries later. All right, I'm a Jew, what can I do? I'm just not convinced. So there's an interesting exegetical question, an historical question. What is Isaiah talking about? Or whom is he talking about? And the answer is, if you look at the notes in the JSP, it's much debated, right? Uh, scholars to this day don't really know exactly what he's talking about. Is he talking about some of uh, the people of Israel as a whole, which is the standard Jewish explanation? It's the people of Israel who suffer for the sins of humanity, right, in their own, in their own suffering? Or maybe it's the prophet himself. Anyway, we don't know. The key thing here is that Isaiah 53 seems to have a notion of vicarious atonement, where one person, the suffering servant, Right is going to carry the sins for us all. And this will prove to be a very formative chapter in the emergence of Christian thinking. And since it's so important to Christians, Jews basically downplay it, given the dynamic of how these things work. Right, if Christians think it must be very important, therefore it can't be too important. Right, in other words, uh, Jewish tradition doesn't know what to do with the day of 53. Okay, we'll discuss that a little bit, a little bit more. So to summarize, we have then sacrifices, we have atonement sacrifices, we have the Day of Atonement and the scapegoat, which is vicarious atonement, like the poster child for vicarious atonement is the Day of 53. Okay, that's one set of, of traditions that later Jews and Christians will see emerging from the text. Seeing sacrifice as primarily a vehicle for atonement. Just as the animal dies so that we live, this human being might die so that we live. Okay. Now I've got a brief section to deal with here, a prophetic critique of sacrificial religion. Justin also will make much of a number of passages, which indeed are very striking. Uh, in my Hebrew Bible course, also we spend a session discussing these passages, uh, in which the prophets uh, critique uh, critique sacrificial religion, or the religion of sacrifices, or critique the religion of the temple dash uh, tabernacle, right? The general light motif is that God doesn't want your sacrifices. God doesn't need your sacrifices. What God wants, of course, is a broken heart, is your piety, is social action. Go out there and feed the poor. Go out there and clothe the needy. That's what God wants. And your sacrifices, you can just keep them. That's a loose paraphrase of the uh, of, of a number of different passages in the pro prophets. And I gave you a look at the major at the major ones, at Hosea 6.6, 6, right? This is the famous one. Um, 
that God does not want zebach sacrifices, God wants chesed. Uh, chesed. How do you translate chesed? Uh, loving kindness. Loving kindness, thank you. God wants loving kindness. Isaiah 1, Isaiah 58, Jeremiah 7, Psalm 51. These are the classic passages. These are the classic passages in which we see this theme. These passages are worth looking at in this context because they will come to loom large in later Christian thinking. So we sort of are going to take sides. Are the prophets saying that God doesn't want your sacrifices? Yeah, because God is telling the Jews he doesn't want all your stupid rituals. That's what God is saying here. Or people say the Jews' response will be, no, 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 that's not exactly what the passages mean. Right, so <coughs> these passages will come to loom large in later Jewish and Christian debate. I already see that already in Justin. Okay, are these passages rejections of sacrifice instead of ritual? Well, yeah, if you read these passages by themselves, one could conclude that's what Isaiah, Hosea, and or Isaiah, or the other passage, Jeremiah, might mean conceivably, right? I'm willing to acknowledge up front these passages are ambiguous. They require interpretation. What exactly is the prophet saying? In any case, as far as I know, no ancient Jewish group is known that rejected sacrifices. Doesn't mean therefore that's not what the prophets meant. I'm just saying that aside from these ambiguous passages aside, comma, right, I can quote any ancient Jewish group, right, that took these passages in this way and develop an ideology that God does not want temple tabernacle sacrifices. Period. And it is an absolute rejection. Just sharing an interesting historical piece of information. And given the realities of the ancient world, it's hard for me to imagine any Jewish group saying in antiquity that on principle God does not really want sacrifices. Because sacrificial religion, as I said earlier, see Religion 101, is everywhere is part and parcel of the religious vocabulary of, of the ancients. So what are the prophets saying? The prophets seem to be saying, this is the traditional Jewish exegesis of these passages, the prophets are rejecting misplaced emphasis. People think that they can be wicked as long as they're observing the ritual, out, the ritual forms. As long as they're bringing the sacrifices, then everything's going to be okay no matter how bad we might be otherwise. And the prophet says, no. The one is not a substitute for the other. Piety and ritual need to accompany each other. This is the classic way in which Jewish interpreters understand these passages, and I think there's some basis in Scripture itself for this reading. For this, for, uh, for, for this reading. Isaiah 58, God wants righteousness as well as the Sabbath. Read the passages. Jeremiah 7, is perhaps the most amazing of these uh, chapters, what Chris may have been alluding to earlier, right? The idea that uh, I redeemed Israel from Egypt even without sacrifices, or I never instructed the Israelites in the wilderness about sacrifices, which is very striking. You read the book of Leviticus, you say, did Jeremiah miss that? I don't, I don't understand. It's half the book of Leviticus. So, but so the question is, what does Jeremiah mean? And the usual way to take it is, well, look, I redeemed the Israelites, and they didn't sacrifice to me at all. Similarly, I can redeem you without your sacrifices because you guys have an exaggerated, misplaced emphasis on the efficacy of the temple and its rituals. Okay, my favorite example showing you how complicated these things are is Psalm 51, which is a beautiful psalm, really a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece, uh, really reflecting inner, inner contrition uh, by the psalmist about sin. Right, that he feels guilty uh, for what he has done. Then it's not, it's all very ambiguous what he has done, but he feels guilty about it. Ignore the heading, Psalm 51. Right? And so uh, the psalmist is saying that prayer is more efficacious than sacrifices. Right? What God really wants is a broken heart. What God really wants is prayer. What God wants is piety. Then the psalm ends. We look forward to rebuilding the temple so we can bring sacrifices. To our Western linear minds, we think this is a contradiction. And our Western linear minds, also especially if you're German, right, are of the 19th century variety, right, you will immediately assume all well, those last two verses are obviously an interpolation. 
Obviously, somebody was shocked by the spirituality of Psalm 51 and tacked on a religiously pedestrian ending endorsing sacrifices. To which my response is, yeah, if you insist on absolutely this monistic linear way of thinking, then yeah, we have a contradiction. But I don't see any contradiction at all. It's, uh, it's this complicated mixture of piety. God doesn't want sacrifices. God does want sacrifices. They're unimportant. They're very important. They're essential. They're not essential. They're all true. It depends on the moment in the religious life. As I said again, religious people can live with contradictions. It's theologians and philosophers who can't. But if it's a real living person writing this, who is affected by sin, he doesn't know how to get atonement. Everything works. Nothing works. I mean, he's... Read Psalm 51 and decide for yourselves. Okay, you guys have questions on this motif. This is a very complicated, this is a big story. We're the tip of the iceberg here. But this would require a look at a whole bunch of passages very carefully and try to understand what their nuances are. I'm simply arguing you need to avoid, you need to resist simplistic statements. Hosea rejects sacrifices. See Hosea 6.6, 6, period. Well, yeah, maybe, but maybe not. It all depends on context. And what does he mean? Etc. Okay. Up to Judaism now, and then those two rabbinic passages. Do you guys have questions, observations? David? It's, um kind of a broader question about law and ethics, but related to this right. one. Um, is, it, is it fair to say that um, fulfilling the requirements of the law, in this case, in terms of sacrifices, is a necessary but not a sufficient <coughs> condition for righteousness? That would be a Jewish response, yes. Right, when Jeremiah et al. are saying, I don't want your sacrifices, I hate your sacrifices. Right, what God is really saying is, I hate the way you do sacrifices. The way you're doing sacrifices is that you're oppressing the poor, you're not, you know, you have an unjust society, you're not following my ways, and you think you can somehow just bring sacrifices and everything will be fine. I hate that, God says. Well, if you'll lump things into broad categories, I want ritual and ethics. That would be the, the classic way to read it, right? Which, again, you could argue at this point. These points are not obvious. Okay, other questions? It's a fun passage to look at in section. You can, may want to do that. Okay, in Judaism, after 70 CE, what happens? 70 CE, the temple is destroyed, remember? So the Romans, as we said many times, the Romans were the most efficient and ruthless reformers of Judaism in Jewish history. Right? They destroyed the temple and brought an end to the sacrifices. Religion 101, be damned, and no more sacrifices. So what happens? So class, how do Jews atone for their sins? Or how do Jews attain atonement after 70 CE? You can believe whatever you want about the sacrifices, but as long as they're there, they're doing something. But they're gone. So our friends, the rabbis, after 70 C, work up a whole theory about how our sins get atoned, even in the absence of all the, sa the sacrifices and all the sacrificial rituals associated with them. Answer. Prayer, Torah study, charity, other pious acts are as good as, if not better than, the sacrifices. There are lots of passages in rabbinic literature, right, to which the rabbis say this explicitly. This is not just a brilliant, intuitive reading. They say this flat out. And they single out prayer, they single out Torah study, they single out charity and good deeds. If you do these, these have the same salvific power as the sacrifices of old. Maybe more so. See that passage in Mark. Okay, lots of par rabbinic parallels to that. Another thing the rabbis do is to develop, heighten, strengthen the idea of repentance. Repentance means, of course, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. That's repentance. And repentance is seen not as a symptom of something has gone wrong with the system, the system's screwed up, 
but rather repentance is seen as a positive religious virtue in itself. There is no one who does not sin or does not go astray, as Solomon says. Right? Everybody's going to sin sooner or later, make a mistake, do the wrong thing. Right? Repentance is a way of saying that the act of repentance, the the yes, the act of repentance has religious value in itself. So repentance is highlighted, is emphasized. We'll look at that in one second in a, in a, in a rabbinic passage. In other words, class, after 70 CE, the rabbis develop an entirely new and different religious system. And let us be very frank here among ourselves. We don't need the sacrifices anymore. Temple has very has been replaced very efficiently. The sprinkling of blood on the altar or whatever and setting out a scapegoat has been left behind. It has been replaced by a completely different religious system. And from our modern Western perspective, let's be honest, a far superior religious system, which does not entail slaughtering anything. Does not entail sprinkling blood anywhere. Does not require the holy temple in Jerusalem or a cast of uh, Cohen's. Right? It's a. It is a much more dare I say a democratic form of religion. It's a much more a spiritual kind of religion. It's a religion much more accessible to everyone. It's a religion that is. Well, we would say it sounds like feels like much more like a religion. Logically, therefore, the rabbis should have been content with what they create. But of course, the problem is that the sacrifices have one thing going for them that Torah, prayer, Torah study, charity, and good deeds don't. Which is to say, God demands sacrifices in the Torah. You got the first half of the book of Leviticus, which does not go away. So in rabbinic piety, there is always the dream that someday the temple will be restored. Someday the sacrifices will be restored. And in the meantime, we got this. And if you say, yes, in the meantime, what you got is a lot better than what you once had and a lot better than what you're hoping for in the future, shouldn't you be happy with what you got? Well, that goes back to Psalm 51 and our religious ambiguities. I can't not want that because that's in the Torah. At the same token, it's obvious that what I have works very well. There's a certain tension here. So in certain forms of modern Judaism, the Gordian knot is cut, and we Jews don't pray for the restoration of the temple and sacrifices. We're, we simply acknowledge them as historical realities of what once was, but we don't want them back anymore. But in traditional Jewish piety, we don't feel we have the right to change the prayer book that way. So we continue to pray for the temple and the sacrifices, even though if you interview most traditionalist Jews, they would say, I don't want the temple back, actually. But we pray for it because that's what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> there, I told you a dirty secret. Uh, secret. <laughs> OK, so um, that's how. That's how Jews get atonement after 70, right? Which the rabbis develop a theory that there are substitutes. There uh, are substitutes for it, theoretically temporary until the temple returns. But de facto, 2,000 years now, I would say these temporary substitutes have had a long life and are not going anywhere. All right. I'm going to stop here and ask for questions. Now we have 10 minutes left to look at these two rabbinic texts, which are coming up on the notes on the next page. A few questions. Are there any traditionalist rabbinic Jews here who want to dispute me? And With yes. the restoration of the temple, couldn't you still have your prayer and your... Yes, no doubt. Things? Right. I have absolutely no doubt that when Elijah comes and the temple is rebuilt speedily in our days, right, that along with the restoration of the sacrifices and Cohen's getting back to work, uh, somehow Torah study, prayer, charity, good deeds, repentance will still have a place in the divine economy. How will this all be fit together? I don't know exactly, but Elijah will know how to fit these things together. I don't know how to fit it together, but he'll know how to fit it together. <coughs> so the 
Jerusalem Temple with synagogues, Torah study, yeshivas. It'll all fit together somehow. I have no doubt. Okay, other questions? Yes, Yoni. To what extent do you think that the rabbinic system of prayer, piety, and whatever the, the third one? Charity, good deeds. And Torah study. To what extent do you think that that was ready to go the day after the destruction of the temple? In other words, was this something that the proto rabbis or early rabbis were thinking of even while the temple was standing? Or? Right, yeah, I wrote an article on that. Right, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> You, you can see anticipations of, yeah, it's in there, right? Actually not, it's in the Cambridge History of Judaism, volume okay. three. I didn't reprint it in there, right? Uh, but you can see the rabbis are taking ideas that are already around the late Second Temple piety, the late Second Temple society, in extremist forms, in sectarian groups that reject the temple and walk away. They're not rejecting the sacrifice, they're rejecting this temple, these priests, this sacrifice, in the hope that there'll be a better temple priest and sacrifice in the future. So there are some groups which have radical ideas. We see that already in Paul. Some pastors in Paul, we see it's reflecting that kind of way, that kind of way of thinking. What? Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls, most famously. Right. So these ideas already are on the fringes of society, and the rabbis take them and develop. We saw this already with the case of Passover Seder. Remember? Yes, our rabbis create the Passover Seder. It's again, it's a way of saying there was once a temple. What are we going to do instead of the temple? We don't have a temple anymore. We don't have a real Paschal lamb. We'll sit around and talk about it. Right? That's, that's the rabbinic piety in action. Right? We're going to transcend the temple. And if you got a Passover Haggadah and a Passover Seder, do you really need a Paschal lamb anymore? Well, frankly, no. It's been replaced so effectively you don't miss it. But nonetheless, of course, we want the Passover land to come back. Maybe. Yes, David. Is intention a necessary condition for valid prayer? Uh, you ask a deep question, my son. The short answer is yes. Long answer is maybe. Right. <laughs> but the short answer is yes. That all the all the commandments to be efficacious. And what does efficacious mean? You ask. It's a good question. But for, for your a good deed, the efficacious requires proper intent. So if you're doing something on autopilot, it doesn't quote count. Uh, you know, you just go. Blah, 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 right. That's not really. That's not anything. Right. Uh, especially in the case of prayer. But this is discussed at great length by the great minds of the Middle Ages. Can can the right sort of intention? Um, Take a, uh, deal, um, resolve a little bit of that obligation to sacrifice that can't. Um, yes, well, that's already built into the prayer book, right? In some versions of the prayer book, we say, God, uh, I'm going to recite the laws of the uh, chatat sacrifice, and may my recitation count as if I had brought a chatat sacrifice. Classical rabbinic piety, you don't have to say that out loud because everybody understands it. But at some point, some medievalist thought you need to say it. Yeah, just to make it verbalized, make it clear. That that's why we're studying these things. That's what we're going to see right now. Okay, I gave you two rabbinic passages. Uh, move the page ahead. Are we are. Uh, we're on uh, Yoma 86b there. Okay, this is a wonderful uh, passage, which um, it's all about the power of repentance. The Torah itself says very little about repentance as a ritual, or the Torah itself simply describes a disaster will come upon you. You will realize the reason the disaster fell upon you is because you had not been good boys and girls. You had not followed the way of the Lord. Then in your grief, you will finally, finally, finally come to your senses and turn back towards the Lord, and then God will take you back. That's a brief description of, let's say, Deuteronomy 4, a number of different sermons in the book of Deuteronomy. Right, the rabbis uh, understand that turning back to the Lord, not as simply a sign of desperation, the way it's described in Deuteronomy, rather it has a religious value. It's a, it's a virtue in itself. And this is the classic page from Tractate Yoma. Yoma is all about the day. Yoma means the day in Aramaic. Which day is it? Which is the day? It's the Day of Atonement. 
So here the rabbis, having just spent 80 folio pages describing in detail how this high priest does the sacrifice, and when they're writing this, of course, there is no temple, there is no high priest, there are no sacrificial goats, there's no spattering of blood, this is all, I have to say, theoretical, utopian, make-believe, whatever it is. Finally, at the very, very end, they actually discuss how do we Jews get atonement, the Day of Atonement, well, without a temple? Answer is repentance. Rabbi Chama Bar Chanina said, Great is repentance, it brings healing to the world. Great is repentance, it teaches up to the, reaches up to the throne of glory. Great is repentance, overrides the prohibition of the Torah. This may sound rhetorically similar to those fra phrases of circumcision that we looked at some, week, some week, weeks ago. In the case of circumcision, I argued that there was someone out there arguing with the contrary position, and the rabbis, as a result, are elevating the importance of circumcision. Here, I would argue the rabbis are trying to calm their own doubts. I would say the rabbis are reassuring themselves. Yes, we can get atonement, right, without the sacrificial rituals, without the scapegoat, without the high priest. We can get atonement, and we do that through repentance. And we say this, therefore, great is repentance, great is repentance, great is repentance, uh, and so on, and so on. The next page, I gave you a handout from Menachot 110a which is another long passage, I gave you only excerpts from it, in which the rabbis again are arguing how the excerpts that I gave you focus on Torah study. That by studying the text, by studying the laws, by studying the Torah, it is as if we observed all the things that are said in it. So I can't bring a sin offering, but I can study the sin offering. And I can't bring a whole burnt offering, but I can study the laws of the whole burnt. Right? And by studying these things and by offering prayer, it's as if I've done it. It's just as good. Maybe better. Right? That's the theme of this page in Menach Menachot 110a. Uh, just the opening line because it's an important one for a Justin Martyr. So they quote the verse of Malachi. From where the sun rises to where it sets, from east to west, my name is honored among the nations, the prophet says. And everywhere incense and pure oblations are burnt and offered to my name. Everywhere, is this possible? Rabbi Samuel ben Achmeni said, in the name of Yonatan, this refers to the scholars who devote themselves to the study of Torah in whatever place they are. I account it to them as though they burnt and presented offerings to my name. Now the study of Torah has the same salvific effect. And that, of course, can take place anywhere among the nations, from east to west. Scholars can sit and study Torah. That's the theme of this page. That verse from Malachi will be quoted by Trifo. Uh, all right. The time is really up. So, thank you all. Uh, again, happy and safe travels. And I'll see you next week. Okay. So did anything uh, anything strike you? Uh, one of the things he actually said, which struck me the first time, this time was the first time, where at least one way to interpret the, the readings, the, some of the texts is that God wants both the ritual and the ethics. And um, and I guess that sort of struck me, you know, this time that you know, are we are we also doing ethics and ritual as Christians? Hmm. <clears throat> that just came to mind when I heard that. I mean, we do have rituals. Well, the point has been made. I remember, um, I think it came up in confirmation, one of my kids, that um, study uh, um, Christian ritual all by yourself, uh, I don't know whether it doesn't count, that doesn't sound right, but it's not good enough. Um, you have to do it as the community. Mm -hmm. You have to go to church. Oh, okay. But wasn't That's he also saying, 
I think it was a little more <laughs> better phrased than I just did. Yeah, but wasn't also, also saying that it sort of has to be coming from your heart too, not just going through the motions, repeating the words, but not thinking about them. Uh, you know, when we do rituals and stuff. Or same thing on, you know, just going to church, but not doing like anything in the community, feeding the poor, uh, clothing the hungry and stuff. That they're, 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 in other words, there's actions that correspond to show the faith is real. Um, I have bigger questions about what is ethics. And who makes them? Could you elaborate on that, Mary? What to, what your well, um, I I have on my bookshelf upstairs a book entitled Christian Ethics. Mm -hmm. Um, so the the title would indicate that there is ethics that aren't Christian. Um, are ethics different for Christians? <clears throat> okay. Uh, I think there are basic ethics that would be true for everybody, but uh, what might be different for us is uh, when Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit and the law would be within us, uh, not just, uh, I don't know, in a book, if that, uh, and that listening to the voice of the Spirit within us is going to take us beyond just keeping the rules. So, well, and there's also I think, what you're saying, Mary, too. There's a context that you said as Christians, because I, I was reading something a long time ago. Is you know, you think a lot of society you see, well, I see it with my Hindu friends and uh, Jews and other people, where you know, loving kindness we talked about, hey, the Bible, or doing good things for other people. There's certain common things we say, you know, don't murder somebody, don't steal. But um, it was about, about a society where they admired deceit. Or something on, to, on that order, and it was like, well, you know, we we don't tend to admire deceit here. That's not something we would think of as being Christian. So, so, but it was something in their society that was good to them. So, you know, it, it gets it, you know it gets the point to where where do you know where do the ethics come from? Um, what what are common? Yeah, I think Christians are called to do. Do more than not do bad things. We have to do good things. Yeah, but that's I, what I was I'm raised saying. by. Yeah, that's what no, I was what raised by things. a Quaker, and it, if you follow the Quaker thought, um, you turn mm -hmm. the other cheek. When someone hurts you, you not only forgive them, you go and help them. Mm -hmm. You know, the family mm -hmm. where where yeah. children were killed, and they went and helped the guy who killed their children because obviously he needed help. You know, I mean that—that's yeah. way out that's past what we do. the normal. Mm -hmm. I think we got into this conversation about ethics because Mitch said something about ritual and ethics. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered why he did. You know, when he was talking about that, when Che Cohen was talking about that, he didn't mention that. Christ uh, went into the temple and turned the tables over and, you know, kind of said some bad things about what was going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was obviously part of the, the, the argument, if you will, the, the, the context. And, he, and he didn't mention it. So maybe he's going to mention it next week. I'm not sure he's going to get into any of the Christian side of this. Um, I don't know if he will, but I, I think he would say that 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 action was in the same um, um, category as some of the other prophetic critiques of yeah. sacrifice. I thought so. It's the yeah. first thing that I so, thought of when he was talking about it. 
Yeah. Um, so, so I think I think at the I think it was just folks speaking on Hebrew scripture though for the moment. So that's why mm -hmm. I didn't bring that up. Yeah. Um, and also but, John the Baptist with repentance. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One explanation I heard about Jesus uh, cleansing the temple is that it wasn't so much a condemnation of uh, sacrifice as the fact that they these people were doing it in the temple. They were money changing and selling animals and all this in the temple instead of, you know, outside somewhere. Mm -hmm. They were desecrating yeah, that's, that's the temple. That's what Cohen said that, well, he paraphrase it i guess that it's not that they didn't the temple was okay it's it's what you're doing there that's not okay mm -hmm. no. um okay so were there any quite did you have any questions or thoughts on we went through a lot of description on like the whole notion of atonement <laughs> in the jewish tradition and that they don't do anymore but the, you know the whole idea of the <laughs> um they actually had two goats one goat was the blood sacrifice, which they sacrificed in the temple, and the other one was that they would that they chased out of the city and chased it over a cliff, um, so, and that was the one that carried the sins of the people. Yeah, well, I, you know, one of the thoughts I thought about with the scapegoat too. I think didn't they put like a red collar or red ribbon on the goat because when they sent it out wandering, I think so. Yeah, if it wandered back into town, like everybody would probably run away from it, or you know, if somebody found it out there, they shouldn't bring it back into their folds you know, so they, they identified it somehow yeah well usually they chased it in a way to make sure it was dead well yeah another time mm -hmm. so. um so i i have to say i feel sorry for that goat <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well and he makes a good point that um and i was reading about sacrifice that this was not um, animal sac. This was not unique to the the Israelites. I mean, it's like you said, that everybody at that time and place was doing that. Uh -huh. um, uh, so um, now, now some people have argued that that was a sign of civilization. Civilization they weren't at least doing it to people anymore. But um, um, hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, but it seems to be a, lots of sacrifices of animals. Why not other things? You know? um, mm -hmm. How did it get started? Other than animals were very valuable, so you were you were giving up something that was very valuable, at least at that time. Right. So. <clears throat> I know one thing in our. I don't know. There's. Uh, I think it's a hymn talks about our sacrifice of praise. I heard that somewhere, it's either am or liturgy. But um, so when we were just talking about sacrifice, I was thinking about you know, the, is that really a sacrifice, or is that what we do now? What I mean, is there? What is? I mean, he'll get into this next week, but I mean, do we feel that we no longer need atonement sacrifices. Well, I, Jesus was supposed to be sacrificed once for all, so. We do have forgiveness of sins when we go to church. So. And I, I think that's just to kind of kind of substantiate what's happening. And, and I, it does bring up the question before, and, and, you know, Jews did atonement once a year. I didn't realize they had these daily sacrifices, morning and afternoon. Um, but but the atonement was something that was only good for a year, yeah. whereas yeah. Jesus sacrifices for all time. And um, I remember there being arguments about using the word Jesus is, is our atonement for us, but they would use the word, what was it, propitiation or something like that? Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's once and for all times. Um, I, I, you know, he didn't get into that here. That's something that would be more of a Christian. Yeah, um, yeah and, well, and he also pointed out that th there were different sacrifices for different reasons. Uh, so yeah. the sacrifice during on the morning and evening was... Is he, I think he used it. It was kind of like the, you know, you did your first sacrifice, the temple was open for business, and then the last one was when you're closing the door. So it was a different sort of purpose. Yeah. And then well, you would have sacrifices for thanks in Thanksgiving, you know. Yeah. But these sacrifices are all temporary. They have to be repeated. Yeah. Until the temple was destroyed. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was very interesting what he said about the temple being rebuilt, how some want it, some don't, but also that we, how he mentioned that a better temple would be rebuilt, uh, saying that there would be better priests. Uh, you know, it would be interesting to hear him say more about that. What, is, you know, what does he mean by that? Well, I think he would just go back to say Elijah will sort that out when he comes. Yeah, that's what he said. He knows. <laughs> Ask him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's about Christians in the second coming. I mean, they they're they're waiting for the second coming, but they probably just assume it not happen today. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, give us some more time. So. Yeah. Any other thoughts on sacrifices? Yeah. Nope. Somehow I've lost this, so I'll say good night. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, uh, all right. So we'll sign off for tonight and uh, we'll see you next week and we'll do the uh, Christian side of things. We'll get more into atonement. Yeah, I guess we'll get more. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.